game over? No way! Because we got Game Genie! We tell you when it's over. With Game Genie, I decide how many lives I get. For many of us in North America, the Game Genie was our first encounter with a cheating device for video games. The Game Genie allowed you to enter in codes that could grant you infinite lives, the ability to jump higher, skip levels, and more. Though it was quite popular, the Game Genie was discontinued in the mid-90s, and another cheating device made for the new generation of powerful 32-bit consoles rose to prominence in North America when Interact released the Game Shark. Interact Accessories welcomes you to the mind-blowing world of video game enhancements with our new Game Shark Pro version 3. GameShark Pro, which is more technologically advanced than any other game enhancer on the market today, promises to take your gameplay to higher levels. The GameShark could do everything the Game Genie could, but better. Not only that, the GameShark wasn't limited to just cheating. With the GameShark, you could play a specific song or video from a game. The CD movie player in the GameShark Pro searches for all the full motion video sequences on your PlayStation game CD. When they're found, you can choose from a list of videos that you want to view. It could be used as a cheaper and higher capacity memory card than first party cards sold by console manufacturers, and there was even a version that could take your Nintendo 64 online. Seemingly an instant hit, in reality the Game Shark's overnight success took nearly a decade. So how did a device that started off as the action replay for the Commodore 64, a product that was created in the UK by a company named Daytel, end up on North American store shelves nine years later as the Game Shark from Interact? Today, we're going to look at how Daytel's Action Replay became the forefather of video game console cheat devices and partnered with a US company founded by a 25-year-old to at least for a little while rule the cheat device market on both sides of the pond. From innovative products, spin-off accessories, copycats, its own magazine, and numerous failed attempts to break into the North American market, this is the story of the Game Shark. It's impossible to talk about the history of the Game Shark without talking about its origins as the action replay. After all, the Game Shark is at its core an action replay, designed and produced by Daytel, but sold in the US by Interact slash STD Entertainment, also known as Standard Entertainment. Daytel's action replay has a long and storied history. In fact, the action replay for the Commodore 64 is sometimes credited as being the first cartridge-based cheat device. In reality, the first two versions of the Action Replay originally used a pre-existing device, the Snapshot 64, as its foundation. The Snapshot 64 was a device that, among other things, could bypass copy protection to copy programs as well as inspect and modify a game or program's code. Daytel had a business partnership with Snapshot 64's parent company, LMS Technologies, who allowed Daytel to use the Snapshot 64's technology. Before releasing the Action Replay line, Daytel had previously sold AMCB radios in the UK. Eventually, the company began manufacturing third-party accessories and hardware interfaces for home computers such as the Commodore 64, Amiga, and ZX Spectrum. Their foray into the computing world would eventually lead to the creation of the Action Replay, which would also see releases for the Amiga and PC. The Action Replay's ability to execute what are called peak and poke commands allowed users to set the number of lives, ammunition, and other in-game parameters. The device also let users create a snapshot of the Commodore or Amiga's memory and then dump it onto either a disc or tape. With these snapshots, users could restart a game right from where they had previously left off, thus the name Action Replay. People soon realized that the Action Replay snapshot and ROM dumping capabilities provided an easy way to create copies of games. While some consumers may have loved this, the European game industry did not. The Action Replay, along with some of Daytel's other copying devices, were blamed for damaging the then-fledgling game market. Allegedly, the Action Replay was in part responsible for UK's Parliament enacting the Copyright Designs and Patents Act of 1988, which explicitly addresses this type of software copying. Between a slump in the computer video game industry and anti-piracy legislative efforts, Daytel looked to the more promising 8-bit home console market to maintain its relevancy. Long before any GameShark branded products would ever hit the market, Daytel released the action replay for the NES, Master System, Mega Drive slash Genesis, and the Super Nintendo. Daytel's first home console version of the Pro Action Replay was released in the UK for the NES in 1991. 
placing it in direct competition with the Game Genie, which was released in 1990 and coincidentally was also created by a UK-based company that's still around today, Codemasters. The codebook included with the Pro Action Replay only covered codes for 19 NES games, as opposed to the Game Genie codebook, which included codes for more than 290 games. On the surface, that might make it seem like the Game Genie was a better product, but the Pro Action Replay included a code trainer that was worth more than a thick book of codes. The Game Genie and Action Replay both worked by making temporary changes to the hexadecimal values in memory. The Game Genie recoded or hid those hexadecimal values into Game Genie specific codes. This made it difficult for a user to create their own codes outside of making wild guesses. The Action Replay, however, did not obfuscate its codes. This meant that with Action Replay's trainer feature, a user could fairly easily discover new codes for nearly any NES game they owned, as the codes would follow a similar pattern, and the trainer would let the user more quickly determine what the values within the codes controlled inside the game. The Pro Action Replay also added the ability to play NTSC games on a PAL console. The Game Genie's success in North America led to Daytel using a Florida-based company, Coast to Coast Technologies, to distribute two Genesis cheat devices in the US in 1992. One would simply be called the Action Replay, and the other would wear the more familiar Pro Action Replay name. The US version of the Sega Genesis Action Replay retailed for $69, while the Pro version sold for $89 with the major difference being that the Pro Action Replay included a code trainer that was absent on the cheaper model. Coast to Coast Technologies appears to have been owned and operated by Daytel themselves, as Coast to Coast Business License lists the founder of Daytel, Michael Connors, as one of its directors. Despite boasting more features than a Game Genie, Coast to Coast Pro Action Replay cartridges weren't nearly as successful as their Game Genie counterpart, and by the end of the year, Coast to Coast Technologies was no longer in business. Daytel then licensed the sale of the Action Replay to Innovation, who announced that they would market their version under the name Game Wizard. Innovation released their Game Wizard in 1993 for the Sega Genesis, as well as the Super Nintendo and Game Boy. Like Coast to Coast Technology's previous efforts, Innovation also failed to compete with the Game Genie, even though the Game Wizard again included unique features not found on the Game Genie. So why were the seemingly superior Action Replay based cartridges defeated again and again? In a word, Galoob. Galoob was a California-based toy company that released a myriad of toys from properties such as Star Trek, Power Rangers, Micro Machines, and in 1990, Codemasters Game Genie. Ironically, Galoob helped to pave the way for the Action Replay's North American release when it won two copyright infringement lawsuits brought against them by Nintendo in Canada and the US. In the lawsuits, Nintendo alleged that the Game Genie's modification of NES games created a derivative work and violated their copyright. Galoob's courtroom victory cleared the way for the Game Genie and other game-modifying devices to be released without the danger of incurring Nintendo or another game company's legal wrath. Unlike the distributors that the Action Replay had used in the US, Galoob was a large company with deep pockets and a substantial marketing reach. All Game Genie releases were backed by a large advertising campaign, frequent free code updates in gaming magazines, and came in a flashy, glossy printed box. By comparison, the Action Replay's US advertising was infrequent, its often bare-bones packaging made it look like a cheaply produced product, and the companies that distributed the Action Replay either didn't have a proven track record when it came to selling video game accessories or lacked a substantial distribution network. Daytel's Action Replay devices continued to do well outside of the US, but were unable to compete with the Game Genie juggernaut in North America. Daytel's fortunes changed when after five years, Galoob opted to no longer support the development of new Game Genie models, leaving the Action Replay as arguably the most well-known cheat device for consoles. With their main competitor gone, Daytel saw an opportunity to finally capture the US market. After failing to break through with smaller US distributors as well as their own distribution attempts, Daytel knew that they would need an experienced, well-financed, and aggressive partner. Daytel smelled blood in the water. Now all that they needed was a shark. The Game Shark made its retail debut in January of 1996, but its road to success is surprisingly long, complicated, and involves no less than seven companies. The Game Shark's distributor, Interact, was the brainchild of Todd Hayes, a young entrepreneur from Maryland. Less than six months after graduating from Pennsylvania State University in 1987, Todd began working for an import-export company called Acemore International Limited. 
Although Acemore had numerous projects in Southeast Asia, only one of them was making any money, the importing of controllers for Nintendo and Sega consoles. By Todd's own admission, their products were of poor quality and the company folded in 1991. Wanting to stay in the video game industry, Todd flew himself to a trade show in London, and it was at this show, over a beer at the Hard Rock Cafe, that he convinced an executive from Hong Kong-based Standard Holdings Limited to give him a chance and the capital to start a U.S. distribution company for video game accessories. Hayes' new company would be named Standard Entertainment USA, who would act as a subsidiary of Hong Kong Standard Holdings Limited and distribute their products in the U.S. under the brand name Interact, as well as Performance. Over the next few years, Todd Hayes and STD were very successful in the U.S., and it wasn't long before they had cornered a significant portion of the third-party accessory market in the U.S. Their success got the attention of Rakuten, a manufacturer and distributor of consumer electronics with a penchant for purchasing other companies. In September of 1995, Rakuten purchased STD Holdings Limited and its subsidiaries. Shortly after Rakuten's purchase of STD, the UK-based creators of the Action Replay, Daytel, struck up an agreement with Interact to distribute the Action Replay in the US. Finally, after years of false starts, Daytel's cheat device would be front and center in North America, now rebranded as Interact's GameShark. In January of 1996, the GameShark debuted for both the Sony PlayStation and the Sega Saturn. Both were massive improvements over the Game Genie that most gamers in America were accustomed to, and the GameShark was just getting started. There were numerous versions and revisions of the GameShark and its related products made available for the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Advance, PlayStation, PlayStation 2, Saturn, Dreamcast, Nintendo 64, and more when you consider the GameShark line of GameSafe's products. For the sake of brevity, I'm only going to touch on some common GameShark features that were generally found in Interact's GameShark Pro products, although I do think that the launch devices are worth looking at in a little more detail. Daytel's partnership brought the GameShark into nationwide retail outlets like Electronics Boutique and Software Etc. A customer picking up a GameShark from one of these locations would be getting much more than just a cheat device. Besides the convenience of being able to store a large quantity of codes, the GameShark also came with a huge bonus. Lots of empty space. The PlayStation GameShark used a feature called VMEM to provide the user with 120 game save slots over the mere 15 that came with Sony's memory card. The Saturn Game Shark came with 8 megabytes of storage, which was approximately 4 to 5 times more than Sega's cards. Overall, the Game Shark provided far more memory per dollar than first party options. The Game Shark's cheat codes essentially worked the same way as action replays did since the 80s, by altering the hexadecimal values stored in memory. Game Shark code is made up of two parts. The first part is quite simply the address of the memory location that we wish to take control of. This might be the location that controls lives, for instance. The second part of the code is the alternative value that we wish to place there. For instance, if this location normally contains only two lives, then the GameShark code for extra lives might read like this, where the 9 equals 9 lives. In order to streamline code experimentation, the GameShark's included cheat trainers helped users to identify and single out which lines impacted game behavior. Besides game cheats, there were other features such as the PlayStation GameShark's ability to let a user browse through the files on a disc, an FMV player to view cutscenes without playing the game, and even a serial port to allow you to connect your GameShark to your PC to make it even easier to locate and enter in new codes. The PlayStation GameShark connected to a port on the back of the console, and is supposedly one of the reasons why Sony removed this port in future PS1 models. This led to the creation of the CDX line of GameShark products, which instead of plugging into a port, used a boot CD in combination with a card similar to regular PlayStation memory cards to store codes. The Saturn version of the GameShark plugged into the cartridge slot, and although it lacked a built-in code trainer, it did include the ability to play games from other regions. The Dreamcast version of the GameShark would employ a system similar to the boot CD memory card combo of the CDX. The Game Boy Game Sharks had more traditional cartridge devices, while the Nintendo 64 Game Shark was reminiscent of the Game Genie, in that you would place it into the cartridge slot and then stack your N64 game on top of it. You could use an included code generator to create your own codes, but this feature required the Nintendo 64's memory expansion pack. The Nintendo 64 also had the distinction of being home to one of the more unique Game Shark devices, Sharkwire Online. 
Sharkwire Online is a really cool product that we've developed to bring kids who have the Nintendo 64 game console online, gives them email, gives them access to a really cool website for gamers, which will be filled with really quality game content that basically gives kids everything they find on the internet right through our Sharkwire Online hardware modem cartridge. You don't need internet connection. What you need is a Nintendo 64, a phone line, and a television. I mean, this box has it all. I mean, you've got your connection cords, the modem, the keyboard, everything that you need from your own room to dial into this, this virtual world. Sharkwire Online was a game shark with a serial port and modem that allowed you to connect to a special dial-up network where users could upload and download game saves, download new cheat codes directly to their game shark, as well as read articles from Interact approved providers. Sharkwire Online also required the memory expansion pack, included a keyboard, and used a mosaic web browser. To satiate concerns from parents, Sharkwire Online didn't provide full access to the internet, only to content deemed as safe for children by Interact. Sharkwire Online sold for just under $80 and required a monthly paid subscription. A PlayStation version of Sharkwire Online was also announced, but never released. To keep its customer base engaged and up to date on new codes, Interact took a page out of Game Genie's book and provided new cheat code updates in gaming magazines via a 1 900 number on their website and through their own publication, Dangerous Waters, which in 2000 became a more fully featured gaming magazine called Game Shark Magazine. But along with success came competition. Although its competitors would never reach the heights of the Game Shark, they were able to turn one of the Game Shark's key features, the ability to easily edit and create custom codes from hex values, to their advantage, and created their own cheat devices such as the Exploder and Codebreaker. Partly out of fear of having their codes used by competitors, the PS2 version of the Game Shark used a proprietary coding system that couldn't be easily deciphered by end users, essentially restricting Game Shark code development to Interact and Daytel. With Interact announcing a Game Shark for the GameCube as well as continuing to produce a steady stream of other Game Shark related accessories, there looked to be no stopping Interact or the Game Shark brand. Appearances, however, can be deceiving. An Orlando Sentinel article from August 21st, 2002 revealed that Interact's parent company, Recoton, had defaulted on its debts, which now totaled $235 million. A follow up article from September stated that Recoton had been losing money for the last few years and its executives placed the blame squarely on its video game division. Just three months later, on December 5, 2002, Daytel ended their distribution agreement with Interact. Interact and Rekuton were in trouble, and this time there was no cheat code that would be able to save them. Under Interact Accessories, the GameShark was by and large mostly a licensed and rebranded version of Daytel's Action Replay. Its success was the culmination of years of Daytel attempting to break into the US market, so clearly Daytel had a vested interest in it succeeding. Yet in some ways, Daytel actually acted as a competitor to the GameShark. Even after signing an agreement with Interact, Daytel continued to sell its own GameShark-like cheat products in the US through a company called Rocket Game Products. In this ad from a June 1998 issue of Electronic Gaming Monthly, Rocket Game Products advertised several non-GameShark cheat cartridges under the brand names Cheat Factory, Game Killer, and Racing and Combat Champions. Most interesting of all was a Game Boy emulator for the Nintendo 64 called Game Booster that also included cheat code capabilities. The Game Booster, like all of the devices I just mentioned, were created and manufactured by Daytel. Rocket Game products may have been based out of Clearwater, Florida, but it wasn't just some company importing Daytel-made devices from the UK. Like Coast to Coast Technologies before it, Rocket Games' business registration listed Daytel founder Michael Connors as one of its managers. Rocket Game products didn't just sell Daytel devices, it was Daytel. Interact actually sold unlicensed Rocket Game titles for the Game Boy Color on GameShark.com, so they either didn't mind the competition or had no choice in the matter since this was a relationship in which Daytel had the majority of the leverage. Either way you look at it, Daytel was in direct competition with Interact and the GameShark. When Daytel announced the end of their agreement with Interact in December of 2002, they issued a press release stating that they would begin distributing their cheat devices themselves in the US under the Action Replay name through another company they had established in Clearwater, Florida, Daytel Design and Development. I located documents that show Daytel Design and Development was incorporated in July, 
almost five months to the day before Daytel parted ways with Interact, Michael Connor's name was once again listed on the business filings. Just a month after Daytel formally split with Interact, Mad Cats purchased the rights to the GameShark brand from Interact and Rakuten for $5.1 million in January of 2003. Three months later, Rakuten filed for bankruptcy in April and moved to liquidate its assets. Mad Cats contracted Fire International to create and supply products to be sold under the GameShark brand. Ironically, Fire International had most recently been responsible for creating the Pelican Codebreaker, one of GameShark's competitors. Under Mad Cats, the GameShark brand shifted its focus away from traditional, code-based cheating products to instead concentrate on devices that allowed you to download and exchange saved game files. These new devices debuted at E3 in May of 2003 and were available for the PlayStation, Xbox, and GameCube. Mad Cats would continue to market GameShark branded accessories for several years, but the days of entering or finding your own codes were over. Sometime in 2012, GameShark.com was taken offline. The URL now redirected visitors to Mad Cat's official website, where no GameShark products were listed for sale. Mad Cats themselves filed for bankruptcy in March of 2017, but was surprisingly resurrected in January of 2018 by former employees from the company's factories in China. The new Mad Cat's website and press release announcing its return made no mention of the GameShark whatsoever. The GameShark of old, the GameShark that so many gamers fell in love with was gone. There are other game enhancement devices for modern systems, but due to the nature of current hardware, it's unlikely we'll see a console cheat device that rivals the GameShark anytime soon. I'd like to thank former Interact employees Jason Dvorak and Chris Cool for their help with this episode. Jason Dvorak runs a gaming website, GameRave.com, as well as an excellent YouTube channel. Chris is the co-founder of the One Up on Cancer charity, an organization dedicated to providing direct financial assistance for adults in the United States undergoing cancer treatment. I'll leave links to both in the description below. If you'd like to reach out to me directly, you can do so on Twitter at WrestlesGaming. And if you're feeling extra generous, you can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash wrestling with gaming. But most of all, thank you for watching.